Welcome everybody to the AABA uh, webinar series. Uh, just a quick note to make sure to put any questions in the question box throughout the presentation. And with that, I will turn it over to Sheila. Hi, everyone. Good morning, afternoon, evening, and night to all of you. Um, I, I, we are coming to you from across 23 time zones. And um, this is the Dialogues and Decolonization Part 2, focused on um, South, Southeast, and Australasia. And I'm Sheila Athreya. I'm an associate professor at Texas A&M University. And um, I am co-moderating this with Dr. Martin Poor. Um, I'll introduce both of us more in a, in a moment. But first, I want to just say that um, we're really glad to finally be here. And we're really honored to have our panelists join us. Um, it's been a long time coming. The part one, this is uh, was always configured as a three part series. Part one was July, it covered the African continent. It's viewable on um, AABA's YouTube page. That was a long time coming. Um, originally, the Committee on Diversity International, chaired by Becky Ackerman, designed it to be um, during the 2020 meetings, which of course, COVID was to blame for that delay. And then we had intended for these webinars to run back to back one month after another over the summer, but the world's still going through really too much to try and force the timing on that. So I'm so thrilled that we're all able to be together, even um, during this difficult time. I just have three business um, matters to kind of attend to at the beginning, and then you won't hear me talk. Um, we'll turn it over to our panelists. But first, I want to acknowledge a few people. Um, not the least of all is our panelists for doing the heavy lifting in terms of sharing their life's work and their lived experiences and their wisdom with us so we can all hopefully, um, you know, not too belatedly follow suit and improve our work in terms of making it more compassionate and thoughtful, which which are markers of excellence. And um, I personally think that um, compassion and empathy are superpowers. And I think that characterizes all of their work. Um, and then I want to uh, give a chance for my co-moderator, Martin Poor from University of Western Australia to just quickly say hello. Doing it Martin. now. Thanks a lot, <laughs> Sheila. Um, that's, that's, uh, that's great. Um, yeah, I don't want to say that much. I just want to say, um, it's fantastic um, to, to be here, and I'm speaking from unceded Noongar-Wajuk land um, in southwest uh, Australia. Um, and um, so I'm really thrilled um, to be here. As Sheila said, um, I'm not going to say uh, that much. Uh, I will moderate a little bit the questions in, in the background and seeing um, how we are going. And um, yes, but um, apart from that, I'm in um, at the University of Western Australia and I'm Associate Professor um, of Archaeology and I'm really looking forward yeah, to this discussion. Thank you. Um, thanks, Martin. And also, I actually, I, I'm glad you said that because I, um, you know, it, given the, the topic, I wanted to be clear, I'm speaking to everyone from Doha, Qatar. And so, um, you know, I appreciate all of you having um, your land acknowledgements and uh, in my case, um, uh, that it, it didn't necessarily apply. Um, although, of course, if I were speaking to you from Texas A&M University, I would have, I would have that um, if I were in Texas. Um, second, I want to thank the um, American Association of Biological Anthropologists and Birkin Associates for um, for providing the webinar platform and and their their labor and their skills in hosting it and training all of us and and making it um, available to all of us on the YouTube channel afterwards. So those of you who couldn't come, uh, sorry, those of you whose colleagues and friends couldn't join because of the time difference, they, they are going to be able to see it. Um, I want to point out in particular um, and thank the um, AABA's Committee on Diversity International uh, Chair, Dr. Becky Ackerman, and um, Dr. Lauren Schroeder and Maya Sheschel, Maya Sheschel for long discussions on how best to organize this so that it's new because I think we're seeing so much of this topic covered and it needs to, um, if we're gonna take up everyone's time, it really needs to be true, truly inclusive and, and new. And um, I think thanks to them, they were so open on how we were gonna configure this to make it that way. And Lauren in particular received funding from the University of Toronto, uh, Black Indigenous and Racialized Scholars Research Grant Program and the Department of Anthropology at the University of Toronto Mississauga for this. The second piece of business I want to quickly go over is the format, and Jill already um, covered some of this, but the format is going to be um, introductions uh, and 
then two rounds of questions where each of the panelists will provide their perspective and experience. And, um, and that'll take us through pretty much the first hour. And then after that will be question and answer. And so everyone in the audience um, can send them either during the panelist speaking time or during the question and answer session. And Martin will be fielding them and collating them for um, that second half. And we'll also use that time to really give the, the panelists a chance to, um, to have some dialogue and, and back and forth with each other, which really enriches it. And then finally, um, just to make sure the audience is on the same page, um, so many of you are um, joining as members of the American Association of Biological Anthropologists. And so I know as a fellow member, um, I'd like to think that I know our, our shared sort of training and uh, the, the canon of knowledge that we, that we come from. And, um, and the concepts of decolonization and, and the definition of post-colonialism really weren't part of most of our um, training. And so I wanna just sort of offer a very simple and understandably reductionist um, definition for everyone. And so, um, you know, the former decolonization is, um, in my mind, the most important thing about it is that it's really about unsettling of the colonizers and their systems and returning stolen land. Um, or in our case, you know, stolen materials, um, cultural remains and, and um, bodies. And the latter, uh, post-colonialism, is a, a broad term encompassing the ongoing struggles with the legacies of colonialism focused on the world that colonialism created and, and the movements for self-determination. And um, so it was really that latter that was the, the center of our minds, and in particular, the center of my mind as I put together the panelists for this web for this um, particular webinar it, it really developed out of um, the idea that um, it, the difficult part now is the transition from just an opposition to colonialism to really articulating principles and institutions and methods of self-determination that's a quote by the way I didn't come up with that <laughs> no. so um, yeah so I just wanted us to all be on the sort of same conceptual and, and intellectual page. And so that's the last thing that I will say, except I do get to brag a little bit about um, each of the panelists as I, as I introduce them. And so um, panelists, what I'd like to do for the first part is um, um, ask each of you to sort of provide just a couple minute introduction that would include um, I mean, I'll, I'll offer your name and institution as I introduce you, but um, please provide any other details that you think might be relevant to this conversation. So that could include anything from your positionality, where you grew up, where you were schooled, basically what you feel that you represent in this context. And um, because uh, we can't see Kaberi, I wanna make sure we start with her. <laughs> <laughs> and so, um, thank you. Kaberi, so briefly, I'll just introduce you. Um, Dr. Kaberi uh -huh. Kagupta is the, is the founder director of the Urban Slender Loris Project in India and a research scientist at the North Carolina Museum of Natural Sciences. And her research um, ranges from behavioral ecology to human socioecology, but in particular, um, it's, it's her work on the ecological and behavioral responses of animals to. Um, changing habitats, particularly ones that are human induced that, that I'm most fascinated by. And so um, her Slender Loris project, her Urban Slender Loris project was featured on Animal Planet, which is very cool. And, um, but it's a citizen science-based collaborative project among various academic institutions, nonprofit organizations, city governments, forest department in India, and um, to develop a conservation program for the Slender Loris in urban Bangalore. So she, um, study the slender loris for her phd thesis research um, but it's really fascinating what she's done with it since then so um kaberi um going to i'm going to be a little uh i'm going to be a little picky about the time so we can make sure everyone goes but okay um yeah please if to, just a, you know three maybe two three minutes two or three minutes of just uh, introducing yourself please that's great thank you sheila thank you for inviting me to this meeting uh, i am I call myself an interdisciplinary scientist. I actually grew up in Calcutta. I, I'm actually sitting in the house where I grew up. Um, after I graduated from college, I went on to doing a master's in wildlife biology 
um, in Wildlife Institute of India, which is a premier institution at the time. Then I went to do my PhD in anthropology, uh, biological anthropology in Arizona State University. But between my first master's and the, and the second master's and PhD, I used uh, five years, I actually used, uh, I lived in the forest, basically, as a research biologist in the Kalakad Mandantarai Tiger Reserve for five years. Um, and uh, after doing all this, you know, after living in the forest for almost 10 years, I, uh, of which well, last two years was with the with a uh, toddler in tow. Uh, I decided to move into doing urban ecology. Partly it's because of family and uh, you know trying to do research fit into my research and, and teaching schedules and stuff. So I have done multiple different kinds of um, urban ecology work, both in the U.S. and in in India. Right now, as Sheila introduced the Urban Slendolaris project, which is um, what uh, I'm currently doing. And apart from that, I've been doing science communication for past 10 years or so. I co-founded the Science Cafe in Fresno. I've um, been doing a lot of um, speeches, I'm giving a lot of speeches. I am also um, doing uh, some work with uh, both in India in terms of teaching and training students and in the US, of course. So, and I also worked with uh, nonprofits like Audubon California. Um, I also had received the leadership fellowship from them, uh, from Toyota Together Green. And last year or two years ago, 2019, I received, a, um, received an award called Paul Sheehan Memorial Award. That's uh, from the Coalition for Public Understanding of Science. So. In that shell, I'm actually doing more of public science uh, in cover covering anthropology to biology, ecology. That's it. Wonderful. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much, Kabari. That's wonderful. Um, next, I would like to introduce Dr. Amber Arunui, and she is a repatriation researcher at the Te Papa Tongarewa Museum of New Zealand. And uh, her she was a research there um, in the repatriation program since 2008. And it was her initial involvement in this program that actually stimulated her desire to engage in PhD research on this topic. And her PhD focused on Maori perspectives on repatriation and ancestral remains. So it addresses an important gap in the scholarship on repatriation um, in terms of voice. And uh, these long-term efforts have really been central to facilitating relationships between the scientific and Iwi communities. So Amber, welcome. <laughs> Tēnā koutou katoa, ngā mihi nui kia koutou i tēnei rā. Thank you for inviting me to participate in this um, webinar today. Um, I very much look forward to our, our conversations. Um, so, yes, quite exciting. Um, but, yes, my name is Am Amber Aranui. Um, I guess my, my career really started as, a, as an anthropology and religious studies student um, at Victoria University in Wellington. Um, I then discovered archaeology, so my background is actually in, in archaeology, uh, and I did my master's um, at the University of Auckland, and um, I was an archaeologist for, um, a practicing archaeologist for a few years, and um, and then some things happened, so I sort of changed tact, but I'll kind of discuss that as, as part of our um, discussion today. Um, but right now, um, I have just been sort of seconded into a new role um, at the moment. So I'm actually now one of four curators um, of Māori descent uh, who are charged with caring for, um, researching and reconnecting Tonga Māori or Māori cultural objects uh, with their communities. Um, but as Sheila noted, prior to this, I spent probably 14 years um, as uh, a repatriation researcher um, for uh, our repatriation program, Karanga Aotearoa. Um, and, you know, and, 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 and that job, um, you know, it was my job to help return our ancestral remains from home, from overseas institutions. Um, and, and this is a topic that I'm uh, really passionate about. Um, and despite me sort of slightly changing roles, I'm still very much involved in, in repatriation, uh, whether that be here in New Zealand or um, internationally. Um, 
Yeah, I want to just thank you all for inviting me again, again to speak, and I and I look forward to to our discussion. So, Kilda, thank you. Thank you, Amber. Thank you. Um, I would like to welcome our um, our our panelist, Dave Johnston, has just joined us. We'll 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 definitely get to. Uh, introduce him. You haven't missed much, Dave, don't worry. And thank you so much for joining us. Um, they very graciously uh, is joining us at really the last minute um, because our original panelist uh, dropped out. And I feel like Dave, is, it's such a get actually to have you with us. So, so thank you. I would like to now introduce Dr. Erin Riley. She is a professor of anthropology at San Diego State University in California. And uh, most of her research falls within the realm of ethnoprimatology, which is the study of human and non-human interconnections. And her work focuses primarily on the interface between humans and, and macaque monkeys. And it draws from primate ecology, conservation biology, environmental anthropology, multi-species anthropology, but also if if I may be so bold, it obviously also has to involve, you know, cultural anthropology in the sense of being about what is valued in the areas where um, the species cohabitate with, with humans. She also played a leading role in developing the 2014 Code of Best Practices for Field Primatology that has been approved by the American Society of Primatologists and the International Primatological Society. So welcome, Erin. Thank you. Thank you, Sheila. And thank you to everyone. Um, I really appreciate the invitation to participate. Um, I'm pleased to join the other panelists in this really fascinating conversation. Um, so I'm a professor uh, in the Department of Anthropology at San Diego State University, which is located on the traditional lands of the Kumeyaay. And Sheila actually gave a really comprehensive introduction um, in terms of my research focus and whatnot. Um, but maybe a little background on, on myself. I'm, I'm living in San Diego, but I was born and raised in Washington, D.C. Uh, I then did uh, move to Wisconsin uh, to go to undergrad at Beloit College, where I focused in anthropology. And when I arrived at Beloit, I was really interested in doing archaeology. Um, but it so happens that the first kind of intro class I ended up taking was, of course, in bioanthro. And my instructor um, and long-term friend since was a primatologist. So I kind of got a little bit more interested in that area of, of anthropology. And so that's that ended up being my focus in, in undergrad. Um, after undergrad, I had an opportunity to gain some experience working with primates, but in a captive uh, setting. So I worked as a, a manager of behavioral care uh, for a research breeding center, actually, for primates here in the United States. Um, I learned a lot about uh, behavior, uh, social behavior particularly, and that's where I fell in love with um, a group of primates called macaques um, and actually got to know about 20, um, 2,000 individuals over the course of a number of years working there. Um, after getting that experience, so I realized that um, that wasn't where I wanted my future to, to, to you know, my trajectory to move, and so I uh, considered going back to graduate school and very luckily ended up in a program that really gave me an opportunity to blend a lot of my interest, um, not only in primatology, but also <clears throat> my interest the anthropology of conservation, uh, which of course draws from environmental anthropology, ecological anthropology, and sociocultural anthropology. And so I, I did my PhD work at the University of Georgia, which has a thematic focus in ecological and environmental anthropology, um, which again, I'm, I'm grateful that's where I landed because it ended up being the perfect place for me to develop my research interests, which as Sheila noted, um, essentially, when I describe myself academically, I often refer to myself as a hybrid because my work really straddles the kind of the natural and social sciences, um, again, drawing from bioanthro, primatology more specifically, um, and then other areas in anthropology, as well as beyond, right, um, conservation ecology and uh, human animal studies. So I'm, I'm, I'm primarily interested in the ways in which people and primates interface and what those interconnections tell us about what it means to be human, but also um, how those interconnections can help us think about ways for people and primates, and for that matter, other wildlife to coexist sustainably. 
Um, as Sheila noted, I've also been really interested um, in thinking about the ethics of fieldwork, primate fieldwork in particular. There's been a lot of conversations about um, bioethics, ethics in terms of um, animal research, but they, I felt like there was a, myself and others, I'm certainly not alone, um, were interested in thinking about these issues from in a fieldwork perspective. And so that's been a really integral part of my work as well. Um, so thank you thank again for you, the opportunity. <laughs> Thank you. Sorry, I, did I talk too long? <laughs> That's okay, but I, I just because uh, I remember, you I told you this already, because you were so good and professional when you were in charge <laughs> that I kind of feel like I actually have big shoes to fill by keeping time. <laughs> so thank you so much, Erin. Thanks for joining us. And um, uh, so, Next, uh, Dr. Matthew Go is a forensic anthropologist at the U.S. Department of Defense, POW, MIA Accounting Agency, and he's primarily engaged in applications of anthropology and archaeology to medical legal issues involving human skeletal remains, with a regional focus on advancing the research and practice of forensic anthropology in the Philippines. And I have more to say, but I do have, I have to mind the time as well. So, um, Matt, please just feel free to introduce yourself now. Thank you. Hello, Sheila. Thank you for having me. Um, I'm speaking to you from Oahu here in Hawaii. And as a guest and settler in the Hawaiian Islands, I'd first like to acknowledge um, that the Aina, or the land that I'm currently living on, belongs to the Hawaiian people, the native Hawaiian people. And uh, Queen Liliopalani yielded the Hawaiian kingdom and these territories under duress uh, to the United States to avoid bloodshed for her own people. And generations of indigenous Hawaiians and their knowledge systems have shaped Hawaii in sustainable ways that allow me to enjoy uh, her gifts today. But before I moved here, uh, my origin starts from in the Philippines. So I was born and raised there. And a lot of people ask, this is important to a lot of people apparently, they ask me like, oh, you don't look Filipino. Um, well, that's <laughs> because I'm, a fourth generation uh, Chinese Filipino. So my great grandparents moved to Ch uh, from China to the Philippines in the early, early um, 1900s. And I was born and raised there. I finished high school there before moving to Canada to uh, go to college. And I had no idea what anthropology or archaeology was at all. Um, and it just so happens that the college I went to was not my first choice. Um, because my first choice would not accept my um, Philippine transcripts off the bat. Um, so I went to my second choice, so, so it all ties in. I went to my second choice in Canada, which just so happens to be a great school for archaeology. And that's how I was introduced to it. Um, I was looking for um, something to do with the sciences, with the biological sciences, but more aimed at human rights. And that's how um, I was kind of introduced to forensic anthropology. And so to, as it happens, um, Simon Fraser, which is where I got my bachelor's degree, um, is great in uh, forensic anthropology. And that really opened the door for me to pursue graduate studies um, in anthropology at the University of Illinois. I was only there on campus for about two and a half years, probably less than that. Uh, before I uh, moved back to the Philippines uh, to do my dissertation research. Um, and then while I was in the Philippines, um, I got the job here in Hawaii to be a forensic anthropologist with the DPAA. Um, and so I moved to Hawaii and then I finished my PhD remotely from Hawaii. Um, and that's uh, where you, I Matt. am now. Thank you so much. And finally, um, Dave, it's a pleasure to have you here. Uh, Dave Johnston is the Director of Aboriginal Archaeologists Australia and the Chair of the Australian Indigenous Archaeologists Association. He's also um, beginning his PhD just now at the School of Archaeology and Anthropology at Australian National University but he earned his BA with honors from ANU and served as a consultant archaeologist for, for 27 years, I believe it was, on more than 2,000 heritage projects across um, Australia. And he's been instrumental in the development of the field of Australian Indigenous archaeology 
to ensure an indigenous perspective and voice in the study and teaching of the subject. And to be honest, when I was sort of putting together the bio, I had a hard time picking, it, I, it, to just have to narrow it down to two sentences or three sentences was terrible because I just wanted to just read everyone, everything I read about you, it's fascinating. But yeah, please, I mean, we only have a couple of minutes, but uh, I really look forward to hearing your introduction about uh, yourself, Dave, thank you. Thank you very much, Sheila. I hope you got folks can hear me. And sorry, I was running late. They're getting um, it's uh, my technology at home isn't as good as at university. Folks, thank you. I'm I'm honoured and privileged to be here. I'm filling in for my great friend, colleague uh, 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 Kelly Pollard, Dr. Kelly Pollard, who couldn't make it today, and, and I'm delighted to to be here. Uh, my name's Dave Johnston. I've been an archaeologist for thirty something years, and in, this is my first fourth decade working in, in within the discipline. I'm, I think I am the first Indigenous archaeologist, but that's irrelevant. Well, our communities are have a role of looking after and preserving our histories and our heritage for the better for our kids' future. Um, I'm, I'd like to acknowledge all our, our all our panelists and our guests here. Um, I'm sitting on Ngunnawal Nambri land here in Canberra. It's not my traditional country. I'm part of the Stolen Generations. I actually found my family this year. I'm both Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander from Kondamooka on Stradbroke Island and uh, Moa Island in the Torres Strait Islands. Uh, it's a pleasure, it's a great thing of this age, finding your family. It's been a lifetime search. Something we do in here in, a, in Australia as part of our historical legacy and some of the issues of which we're fronting. I've been involved with Heritage forever. I have a company, Aboriginal Archaeologists Australia. Um, I've been working as a consultant. Uh, my time at being part of the Solon Den, I grew up on a lighthouse at 11. I just, my mum asked me, do you want to be an archaeologist? So I was exploring the caves. And I thought, yes, I, I had no idea the politics that the path would take me through and which I still do today. At the end of this, I'm starting this week my PhD, 30 years after I did my master's at London, at London University and 34, three years since I did my, my BA honours. Um, I'm still working in, the, in, in a range of areas. I work for myself, but I work for traditional owners all over the country. I do politics, archaeology. Some of the things I'd like to talk today is about some of the biological aspects and the areas that I've worked. I've got a team working on a, a dingo, a, the, the, the remains of a burial where a dingo skull has been associated down at Wilson Prime in Victoria today. Um, but I'd also like to talk today possibly about some of the Willandra Lakes World Heritage Area where I had the privilege of being asked by the elders to um, work and to prepare their World Heritage Management Plan some 20 years ago um, and they asked me to be their chairman for their, their independent chair for the World Heritage Area. So I'd like to discuss some of the biological, anthropological, archaeological aspects today and um, yeah I'm very grateful to be here. Thank you for asking. Wonderful, thank you so much. All right, so um, panelists I'd like to and for the audience too we kind of have this divided up into two um, sort of ways of thinking about the issues. And so the first is to ask the panelists some uh, questions that relate to an analyzing the problem and um, requesting each of them to speak for about five minutes to at least just get us started on the conversation from each of their perspectives. And so um, Kaberi, we'll start with you, but so the analysis questions for all of you are um, based on your experiences. Um, first of all, you know, what do you think are the specific challenges for the region where, that that you that you that we're discussing broadly in this webinar, mm -hmm. and then the ones mm -hmm. that you think are relevant for your country in particular? And I think um, you know, tied to that are going to be um, you know ways that the legacies of colonialism are are impacting your disciplinary area. And are you know creating these challenges, and and maybe even at the personal level, sort of what personal experiences or witness practices um, that you want to share, so that our audience can really understand the problem and its um, breadth and its depth, scope and depth. That's great, so, Kaberi. So you want to start um, with us, yeah. Can I start now? Okay. Please, yeah. So I I think. I think uh, along with colonialism and post-colonialism uh, and the talk of decolonial decolonizing uh, ecology or anthropology, uh, one thing that I think is also important that we don't really talk about it is neocolonialism, uh, especially in the uh, post-colonial era um, 
you know, um, it comes with funding, it comes with uh, the pedagogy, it comes with epistemology, all of those things. And a lot of times we just forget that, you know, if the money is coming from uh, World Bank, for example, then you have to have, they have their agendas. So even if you are doing research in, you know, for example, in animal behavior or, or doing uh, social cultural anthropological research, but they, they have their own agendas, which actually has uh, more of a, uh, uh, um, well, colonial or neo-colonial attitude towards that. So they, that all comes with some hidden agendas, as we call it. So that's one problem. The other problem also is um, in terms of dealing with, you know, as a, it, it, for me, it's interesting because I am a, um, I, I'm a, um, I'm, I'm Indian and I uh, studied in the US. And so when I come back to do research here, a lot of times people are like, oh, you're from the US, so you are doing American stuff. And when I go to America and live there, and then, you know, I have heard people telling me that you need to change your accent uh, or you're not American. So why are you doing this work, especially in citizen science kind of work? So, so these, these are, uh, you know, problems. That's problem in personal level. But also the other things that I think is very, very important that we don't do it is um is inclusion you know we talk about inclusion and diversity all the time in last 10 years probably but we do we really actually do inclusion and and um, diversity stuff uh, and it it is all over i mean i just did a, a citizen science meeting in india where we were talking about inclusion and it looks like that you know inclusion here is not only just a K, um, class level, socioeconomic class level, but also in the caste level. Whereas in the US, it's uh, race and ethnicity level. So there are these, uh, you know, apart from socio socioeconomics, so th there are all these, um, you know, layers of, uh, of social, uh, I guess it is a social thing that actually uh, deters, uh, deter us to do, um, you know, work with people who are indigenous in or, or living in the community so so i think we have as anthropologists or as primatologists we have a lot to do and uh, we are still trying to figure out how to do it we pondered upon uh, you know uh, writing a paper recently that came out in science about how to include uh, in how to do inclusion in community science or or um, you know uh, a broad term citizen science project projects so um i can talk more i can talk a lot i i can also talk about how uh in a very personal level when american uh, researchers come in uh, and do their research and don't acknowledge uh, any of uh, you know or don't uh, follow the rules of um of the country where they're doing research or you know use bribes and and doing research so those are the things that i think we need to think about it uh, more carefully in the past i have i knew someone who was doing this kind of work and i had told people but it didn't work so anyway i think i'm hoping that that kind of attitude and and this patronizing attitude is is going to change or has been changing in the last 10 years or so yeah yeah, those That's are great it. points, Kaberi. Thank, thank you. Thank you. And I just want to remind our audience, Kaberi is joining us by phone. Um, yeah. So you won't be seeing her, um, but you hopefully can all hear her. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much. Okay, um, so I can't remember. Who was that? Amber. <laughs> so Amber, do you want me to repeat the questions for you? Um, just in terms of your analysis of the of the issues from sort of broadly regional to, uh, you know, local ones for you to even just very personal one. Can I just ask that someone else go first? I just have to move, if that's all right. <laughs> yep. Absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry. How about, how about um, Dave, are you willing to go next? And yeah, yes, sure, no. I am. I am I'm doing it on purpose because I, you're the closest one to New Zealand. <laughs> <laughs> folks so um all right um 
I guess I'll sum up. There's so many issues, as you're aware, happening in Australia. And this is, we're never short of adventures. Like, uh, the latest, folks, is like, as you would have heard, we've had our, you know, some of our key sites, Dook and Gorge, a major one, which we, Australian public and our communities, except for the um, hippie KKP people, weren't aware of, have been blown up. We're at a point here, which, which is why I'm taking a sabbatical and doing my PhD, or I'm not kind of copying out. It's because our, 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 our society, our governance, from our Commonwealth level, okay. this is how I'm it, has basically dumbed down our heritage legislation across the country some 20 years ago with a step-by-step -step decline to allow each of our states to govern our own Indigenous heritage and environmental laws. This dumbing down of our legislation has meant the mass destruction of our sites, our heritage, a complete disregard for our peoples, our heritage, and our old multicultural Australian. It's, it's just stupidity, it's greed, there's no other thing. And the issue here, I think, relevant to all peoples and all of us here within Australia, is the, the post-colonial, neo-colonial, if you like, attitudes that still exist here. Basically, folks, it's raw racism, and it can only come down to greed. I believe there's a discord or disconnect between what the public feel our, our, and including our communities and what's happening in our, in our government. Australia, because of COVID, and we're, here we are, I'm in my eighth week of lockdown, which is why I didn't iron today. Um, uh, we've never dealt with Black Lives Matter, which was beaming out from the rest of the world. This is COVID's coming in. And as I say publicly, the spotlight went on Australia. Oh, hey, what, what's Australia doing with, in, in relation to Black Lives Matter? And the spotlight goes on, and here we are in Western Australia, one of the most atrocious states, blowing up sites galore, each minor. But this is, as I say, this has been happening for 20, 30 years. And Western Australia, the, the, the areas such as the um, um, Swan Brewery at the area, Yagel site in Dub Perth was blown up overnight. The Monday Swamp, the most significant spread at the Perth airports, something I dealt with 30 years ago, it's still being destroyed. We've got the um, Barrett Peninsula, a site that should have been listed as a world heritage site for its ancient rock engravings. They graded all the piles up and put them in fences, and now the archaeologists and the companies who've done that are trying to argue, justify it. It's, it's been going on in WA for 30 or more years. <clears throat> But it's been happening all over the, over the country. So my point of this is, and as we're trying to do heritage reform today and deal with a government agency backed by the mineral councils with a corrupt native title process, trying to, uh, uh, I was at a meeting last week, uh, two days ago, where they're fronting this re, uh, uh, reformation of heritage reform without our peoples. It's, it's a governance ownership. But with half a brain, you can see what's going on. So our heritage management in Australia has been declined, but it's been a deliberate uh, Commonwealth agency that has allowed this to dumb down. So we can't blame the mining companies when they've got a yellow brick road to the detonator, ooh, in WA and everywhere else. So when people like myself and others stand up for this, you know, I've had a career of being ostracized, shunned for 30 years. Trying to stand up, and it's not just me. I mean, this is what I've taught my elders. All our communities are doing this. So um, I am no one special. I just have the privilege of education in a Western sense. And being here, a lot of my brothers and sisters are no longer here. And what we're able to, to speak up this. And we are only representing our communities and our elders. We've got a long way to go, <coughs> but our mob are strong and, and, and uh, are very staunch. And the corruption and those of our own people who sell out, who are the stooges for these mineral councils and these native title bodies who are trying to sell us out, we call them out and we will be continuing to do that. Meanwhile, that's the frontline sort of things, but you know, the Australian archaeology, our heritage, our connection to the world the, as the world has recognised us for our antiquity, our you know, survival through millennium, you know, is an amazing story. I think what I've been doing, just in my own personal journey, is having, I think, failed miserably as a career uh, Indigenous archaeologist. Just saying that, and here's, a, here's something I'll leave for all of you. While Kelly saves me, there is not one, apart from me now and uh, young Rob Williams, 
There is not one Indigenous archaeologist in any archaeological department in Australia. Folks, explain that. You know, I graduated in 1989. It took 30 years for my ANU to, you know, or actually in 2004 I first took, to come in. We've got a long way to go within the university, Western structures and how they treat our people. There are hundreds of courses on Indigenous being taught in any university in Australia. But where are black faces and bums on the seats? I don't need to explain this, but it's about time the others. We're no longer the, 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 the elephant in the room. You know, there's a lot of racist elements there. Um, yeah. There's some great stuff now in history. And my last point I'm saying, it's, I would have long argued Australia's Indigenous heritage or culture is our greatest unrealized asset as a multicultural nation, contemporary nation today. We need to adjust, reform like the rest of the world, deal with Black Lives Matter, have some truth telling, and in particularly in our Australian governance, some transparency in how we deal and who is sponsoring our governments by which mining companies, which multi corporates and they have a truth telling and then I think we can go on and respect that the uniqueness and richness um, of yeah. Australia's yeah. heritage. Thank, Thank you, you Dave. Yeah, great points. Um, okay, Am Amber. Sorry about that everybody. <laughs> um, yeah, I can, I can relate a lot to what Dave is saying. Um, you know, in the South Pacific, um, issues around decolonisation, particularly in the museum space, um, has been going on for some time, both here and in Australia. Um, and, you know, it's still got a, lot, a long way to go, I think, um, in, in, <laughs> in, in both regard. Um, but, you know, I think there, there is some work being done. Um, and sort of like Dave says, it's also been a topic of many academic studies, particularly within um, Indigenous studies departments, whether it's Aboriginal studies, Māori studies, um, Pacific studies. Um, and I think, you know, New Zealand, the thing with, with us here in Aotearoa is that, you know, we are a country um, based on the Treaty of Waitangi. It's our sort of country's founding document. Um, and I guess until... Uh, the Waitangi Tribunal was created in the 70s um, and, and that tribunal was, uh, I guess, a permanent commission of inquiry and was set up to deal with Māori claims um, in relation to the Crown's branches. Um, can you hear me around? Yeah, we're going to have feedback, Amber. We can't hear you anymore. Actually, can everybody else can just mute for just a second? Let's just see if that's if it's. Are we good? That's better. I think it might have been Aaron. I'm not, I'm not sure. <laughs> um, so yeah, so you know, our, our tribunal process was sort of set up um, to deal with claims by Māori against the Crown for breaches of the treaty that they created. Um, and so this really has brought about many discussions, protests, policy changes. And I guess in the case of Te Papa, the museum that I work for, the creation of the country's first bicultural institution. And it was centered around acknowledging the Treaty of Waitangi and its importance uh, for us here in Aotearoa. Um, but I guess with um, regard to legacies of, of colonialism and how it sort of uh, impacts um, the area that I work in, um, within the museum space, work to decolonize and, and I guess at the same time address our colonial past, um, as you can imagine, is, is ongoing work. Some days it's a battle. Um, because, you know, museums by their very definition are colonial constructs. Um, and today, many of us in this space are trying to do our part, um, you know, to enact change and ensure that um, museology, especially in Aotearoa, creates a space for the communities to reconnect with their cultural objects and also to be more proactive museums, um, I mean, to be more proactive in returning taonga or, or cultural objects to their people. 
um, especially those that were stolen and confiscated as part of our sort of the colonization of our country. And that's a really big thing at the moment. A lot of our treaty claims um, include the return of cultural objects, the return of ancestral remains, um, and it's becoming more and more uh, common within um, with each tribal group um, presenting their claims. So that's something that I've um, seen has been really, um, really interesting and really powerful. Um, in terms of sort of what I've um, experienced um, and witnessed in terms of um, uh, our colonial legacy, um, a lot of that actually comes from my um, work as an archaeologist. And Dave, I, I feel you <laughs> in your uh, frustration. Um, and like for me, the holding of knowledge of our past, um, you know, and who holds that knowledge, um, you know, in the university space, you know, it was uh, the archaeologists who were seen to hold the knowledge. Um, and actually, I, I found it quite strange um, that there wasn't enough interaction with community members, with people whose land we were digging up, um, in terms of where that knowledge lies and what those stories were telling us, what those, um, what the archaeology was telling us. And, and I, I struggled with that. Um, as an undergrad, as an anthropologist, I was led to believe that, you know, for me as a Māori, I couldn't study my own culture because I provided a, a, a biased view. And I was like, what? <laughs> and even today, I sort of struggle with, uh, and I think it's, maybe it's changed now, but, um, you know, I, I don't know, I, I had issues with that. Um, so it made me more determined um, to be an anthropologist or to become an archaeologist to, to show that what I was taught at university actually wasn't necessarily the case. Um, also, I guess, you know, growing up as a, as a youth um, and learning about the history of my people through the school system, um, it wasn't until I got to university that I found a lot of those stories were lies. And I was like, Flippergasted, to, you know. To be honest, it's like, how can they, how can they teach us this when it's not even true? You know, who is telling these stories? Um, and a lot of this information and the information that sort of gets into schools um, was was put in there by people that never even came to New Zealand. You know, so yeah. So I mean, I have yeah. I guess that's kind of made me into the person I am today, and and made me so passionate about sort of repatriation and and. And not just about repatriating ancestral remains, but also, you know, our cultural objects, our knowledge. A lot of those knowledge stories that have been recorded by anthropologists that sit right. in museum archives, you know, um, it's important to repatriate that back to their people because that's who it belongs yeah. to. Um, so, yeah, right. so I mean, that, that will do. That's enough that's for me right. now, but yeah, so thank you. That's a great point. Um, yeah, not just that material objects, but the, the narrative itself needs to be repatriated. That's a great idea. Okay. Um, okay. So, Erin, um, um, can you go next? Sure. Hi, everyone, again. Um, so, I guess one of the things that I am, again, addressing the questions um, regarding um, specific issues and challenges and legacies of colonialism um, impacting our disciplinary, or particularly within the areas and the country, for example. And I can't remember if I mentioned in the intro, but I, I predominantly work in Indonesia, in the island of Sulawesi. And, you know, one of the things that's, that is very obvious to me, and, and I, I think many others, is that climatology in Indonesia, and probably even more generally in Southeast Asia, is largely predominantly practiced by researchers from the global north. Um, there is a growing cadre of Indonesian primatologists, um, a majority of whom are situated in Western Indonesia, largely from the island of Jawa. Um, and the research focus is predominantly on hominoid species, so gibbons and orangutans. And so it's been really exciting to see the work that they're doing. And, you know, for instance, um, there was a recent paper that came out in Oryx, which is a conservation journal. It was co-authored um, solely by Indonesian primatologists, nine of them, um, talking about the future challenges and recommendations for the conservation of Indonesian gibbons. Um, and so that kind of movement is super exciting. But one of the things that I've thought about a lot um, is how the geography of primatology in Indonesia 
largely reflects um, a legacy of kind of cultural, economic, and political hegemony of Western Indonesia to the exclusion of other areas of Indonesia. And I just find that very fascinating. So in terms of my own research working in, in Eastern Indonesia, um, I've had trouble uh, finding collaborators, particularly when we're talking about, for example, how do we make our host country collaborators ensure that they are full partners, right? In all aspects of, of the research, from the, from the early decision-making, the grant writing, the question asking, right? Conducting the research. And where I've struggled a little bit working in Eastern Indonesia is finding the collaborators with, this, with the kinds of expertise that that is needed for that full kind of collaboration so on the one hand it's been great particularly because a lot of primatological research is interdisciplinary so we draw from ecology and so forth and so i've been really benefited in that sense i've worked mostly with folks in ecology and that's been great but finding primatologists for example in Sulawesi has been much more difficult um, another issue certainly is accessibility of research, right? Primatology research is published in English. And, you know, this is, this makes it much less accessible to Indonesians. Excuse me, my cat would like to join us. <laughs> um, um, basically kind of perpetuating some of the inequities that we're seeing, right? Um, particularly, again, mostly affecting Eastern Indonesia where English is less, less widely spoken, right? So. You know, and on the one hand, you know, social media has been very effective in this source because we can sh we can share our research and our research findings via social media, and we can do so in the languages that are intelligible and understandable to other people. But when I what I think about is graduate level study, right? So you know, when you're when it's a critical that you're immersing yourself in the literature, but that literature isn't accessible to you, right? And so how do we get around that? And I know that the onus is on us, myself included, right? as well as you know the publishers right in terms of making this uh, a, a, a priority and i'll share like a recent experience i just recently with some collaborators published a paper um and i asked it's not their tradition to publish an abstract in another language but i asked if we could publish one in indonesian and i never even got a reply from the editor-in-chief right so so you know i feel like these are kind of some of the challenges that that remain in terms of practice like witnessing practices i know and this is this mirrors something that kaberi brought up earlier i know for a fact that in the past and maybe even still today but i know i've heard stories in the past of researchers from the global north completely ignoring the research permit process in indonesia and i will share from my experience of working there for 20 years it's a huge pain in the butt there's so much bureaucracy there's so much red tape but you do it right that's that's what you do and i you know i i that's how i train my students i train my students to follow the process and i know many people have 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 skirted around that and i think that that reflects a power imbalance that i don't need to do that i'm coming into this research i don't need to do the deal with this process um more recently um one thing that i've thought a lot about and and wondered if it was just my own personal kind of bias um and this is something that may make me unpopular maybe among primatologists some primatologists but i thought a lot about the naming of projects right oh, yeah. how do we choose how to name our projects and one of the things that i've seen a lot recently in um in primate projects in southeast asia is naming a project based on the species right so just the project name is the species name. And what goes along with that is that many of these projects are predominantly led by researchers from the global north. Now, many of them are collaborating with host country scholars. I guess the issue I have with that is that it, it's somewhat emblematic of yeah. claiming knowledge production, as if this is the project that produces knowledge about this species. And what happens to others that may be doing that? Perhaps local students, right, who are not part of that project, or even other foreigner researchers that are doing research but are not subsumed under that project. And so I think that's something I think we need to be more mindful about because we know that words matter, right? It shapes the way that we perceive the world, right? 
how we conduct science, who controls the production of scientific knowledge, and who belongs right. and who doesn't belong, right? I think these are right. some issues. And I think this is happening in primatology um, as evidenced by recent conversations about how it's probably time, long overdue, for us to ditch words like old world monkeys and new world monkeys, right? Because these are essentially traces of colonialism that persist in science. Yeah. Um, so again, yeah, some people great. are like, it's just a name, Thanks, but I think it, yeah. we need to talk more about it. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Great point. Um, Matthew. Yes, I I love everything that Aaron just said, and I want to piggyback on on two things. The the first one is um, publishing, and like in Southeast, my research has shown in Southeast Asia in general, and actually in the world, the the, the global north really dictates research and publications um, within forensic anthropology, and it really centers um, white and European narratives. Um, even in something as specific as papers that um, talk about ancestry estimation, for example. So like, you know, looking at the skeleton and trying to determine what ancestry that person was. 88% um, of, of papers in the past five years um, include Europeans as a group of comparison and, and only 12% do not. And then in papers that, are unrelated to ancestry, where that's not the main goal. 49% um, of papers must include like Europeans as a group to study, which kind of perpetuates this historic tendency to uh, measure all human variation against one particular norm, which in this case is Europe, um, or you know, Europe, European derived populations like in the US and Australia, South Africa. Um, and even Brazil, um, and it also relates to citational practices. So my research has shown that people from the Global South are far less cited, even though they're publishing on similar topics in the same journals. Um, and if uh, Global South and Global North authors are co-authors on the same papers in these high impact journals, the more respected author positions are given to Global North uh, researchers. So that, that would be talking about, let's say, being first author or being last author or being corresponding author. Um, and somehow, uh, like less important topics are are kind of left as scraps for Global South uh, researchers to pick up. So if, if you look at the research in Southeast Asia uh, on forensic anthropology, like more high impact, highly cited papers that look at higher level theoretical um, discussions are led by Global North researchers. And then more like niche, um, niche topics that very, very few people will be interested in are the ones that are being like written by Global South researchers, even though the material that both of them are working on are from these Global South countries. Um, and then the, um, the other thing that Aaron brought up that I would like to touch on is like the bureaucracy or the red tape, you know, like permitting and et cetera being so ridiculous. Um, these systems I feel are learned and inherited from colonizers uh, like the Philippines in particular has been was a colony um, longer than it was a country right as is the case for much of the global south and a lot of the systems that we have in place a lot of the government agencies etc were formed by uh, the colonist rule and how they operate and, and the spirit in which they operate is very much reflective of the, their initial purpose. And in forensics, for example, uh, you have to talk about the police because they investigate homicides, missing persons, etc. cetera. Um, the, the Philippine National Police is in charge of, of all of that. And they were formed um, out of the Philippine Constabulary, which was formed by the US government to fight revolutionaries trying to gain independence. And so 
in forensics and in forensic sciences, the Philippine National Police is not really concerned about solving a crime more than it is, con and this is obviously my opinion, more than it is concerned about protecting government interests, uh, protecting government power, protecting, protecting government sovereignty against whoever might, um, you know, fight against the government. And so I feel like the parallels are very obvious in terms of like, what the, the initial purpose was that the Americans wanted versus how it operates today. Wow. Um, and oh. I think that many people entering these Global South contexts will find similarities in that, but it's not entirely part of normal discourse. Like once you actually look at the history of these things, you start to see like the, the very obvious connections that, that we often forget about. That, that's fascinating. That, thank you, Matthew. Um, I want to just remind the um, audience that you can type in questions, and I encourage you to do so. Although, if you don't, I guarantee you, I have plenty for the ones <laughs> I've been writing. So we'll be fine. But if you want, if you want your turn, you better go because otherwise I'll take over. Okay. Uh, so, so. The second um, sort of round of discussion or questions before we move to a more open format is, um, is you know, the way forward. So, you know, you all presented, just each of you presented um, such insight onto different pieces of the issues. Um, and so with that big picture, you know, the way forward questions are um, about, Things, I mean, broadly speaking, we want all of us, um, and especially those of us whose positionalities are different, whose lived experiences don't provide us with these insights, um, to know more about the way forward. And so, so some of the questions to consider um, in this in this portion of the discussion are, um, you know, are the actions currently being taken to achieve um, either a decolonized or a post-colonial, you know, biological anthropology in particular, but anthropology in general, um, you know, as it's as it's defined in your country, or archaeology, are they sufficient? And and what are examples of um, good practices? And um, I'm avoiding the term best practices because that tends to co-opt. <laughs> you know, we got the best. So what are examples of good practices? And, and then the second, um, you know, thing to consider is, is uh, I would love insights on how you would change the way that archaeology, anthropology, um, you know, primatology is being practiced in your region. And, um, and to the audience listening, um, you know, I sent some specific questions for our panelists to consider. And so for Amber in the Museum of Curatorial Space, for Matt in sort of um, in the uh, applied spaces such as forensics for Kaberi in terms of um, engaging the citizen science, you know, community stakeholders, um, for David in terms of sort of centering indigenous scholars and their approaches to knowledge construction, and for Aaron, some successful practices that you as a scholar from the global north have adopted um, that, that you wish for others too. So you're not limited to these, but I think your individual insights are also going to really enrich the discussion. So. We'll start with um, Kaberi. You can unmute. Can you hear me now? You might be on mute. Yeah, perfect. Go. Okay. Um, so it's a for me. If you want to ask. You wanted to know about um, community engagement, right? It uh, can be. Although, really, any of your insights on achieving. I mean, you have so, you've you know written and discussed so much on achieving a decolonized sort of, you know, decolonizing science as we, you know, as we mm -hmm. practice it. So anything, really. Well, I, I still, I'm still trying to figure out what would be the better practices. Uh, given that, you know, we still have that, as Dave said, and um, uh, Aaron said, that we still have the colonial um, infrastructure or colonial mindset on, in bureaucracy, in academia, um, in the way we run our um, forest departments or wildlife 
um, studies or wildlife research and all everything. So I, I'm not sure how to actually decolonize everything. I think it needs a systemic, you know, system change. Uh, it needs a mindset change. Uh, it needs um, so many, so many things. Um, but for community engagement, I think if any researchers, whether it's a researcher from the host country or from global north, um, I think one thing that you really have to consider is um, connecting with people, local people, whether you are in archaeology, you're doing archaeology or, or biological anthropology or cultural anthropology, I guess. So I think in cultural anth anthropology, people have been thinking about decolonization for a while. I think it's probably from the 80s. Um, but I am not sure whether we have done as much as, as uh, you know, thinking in primatology. And so, especially when you are studying a primate, uh, you know, in whether it's in a uh, protected area or in a um, habitat which is um, which has humans, so human dominated landscape, I, I think you need to understand, um, you know, the culture first. You need to understand, um, you need to go and um, make sure that you are actually listening to the people you are you are not trying to patronizing them you are not trying to tell them what to do or you don't come you don't go with your own idea i know as a phd students in the us you have to have some um, you know pro project proposal um, and you, so that means you have to have some preconceived uh, you know or uh, not pre preconceived notion but you have to have some preconceived ideas uh, but you know, we all know that it doesn't work all the time. I mean, I go, I, I can come with something and then, you know, in my mind, and then it changed because of the, the situation there in field. So, um, so I think, I think the main thing when you go anywhere, it's that respecting the communities, uh, respecting the marginalized communities that are living in outside protected areas or in the margins of, in the periphery of the cities. And then um, language. I think language is really important. Uh, not only just how you speak, but what languages do you want to use or what languages do you want to learn? And I think Erin probably would be able to talk more about it since she has got, I mean, she's been doing research in Indonesia, with local people. But one thing I noticed as um, Matt also said, um, that when you are in global, north um, people if they see any research papers or research um, grant proposals from global north, global south the first thing they would say that oh you know it's the english it's not good or it's not it's not correct or sometimes i even heard people saying my own colleagues saying that ha huh, you know how dare you correct my English, you are not coming from English speaking countries, um, so whether it's from Brazil or from India or, you know, any other countries, any other parts of the world, the global south. So I think that attitude needs to be changed. The attitude change is extremely important before we even do anything, you know, in terms of trying to do any, any research projects. And then the other thing is like, um, you know, the uh, access to journal, as Erin mentioned, um, we do have a lot of open access, but we still don't have a lot, you know, most of our journals are, at least the articles that we publish are not in open access journals. So um, in fact, this um, tonight, I was before the meeting, I was trying to find some article and I couldn't find because um, I have to pay. And so, so these are the problems that we face, and and or the people in global south face that needs to be needs to be changed. Then the other thing is also long term so, mentoring. Go ahead. Sorry, Kaberi. I'll just. I mean, okay. Well, I'll make sure to make a note of that long term mentoring, and um, and we will be sure to get back to that. Okay. Yeah. Thank. Yeah. Thank you so much. Thank you, Jill. Uh. Okay, uh, so Amber, we'll go to you next, I think, this time. Um, in terms of our, our ways forward, 
um, I think there is change. Um, I'm not sure how we can truly measure that, um, I guess, at a global level. But um, the people I work for, um, or I work with in the, in the field of um, repatriation, I guess they do come from a generation, in New Zealand at least, where respect for the dead and their living descendants is paramount. Um, and as a general rule, I think uh, research on Māori ancestral remains um, is not done here in New Zealand without permission from descendant communities. Um, so there's no sort of research for research sake. Um, but I do say as a general rule, because, you know, of course, there are always the exceptions and there are the rogues, there are the staunch tr traditionalists um, who are still of the view where they don't feel they need to seek permission um, because it's it's their right to be able to undertake that mm -hmm. research. Um, and so, you know, that's, we don't have too many of those in New Zealand, but if we do, they very much undercover <laughs> um, because the vast majority um, is is definitely acknowledging the connection they have with the living community. Um, I think good examples um, of the work that I do with biological anthropologists in particular um, in the repatriation space is that relationships, um, the relationships that we have are not built on academic or scientific research priorities. They're built on um, community service and actually the desire to build meaningful relationships um, with people here in New Zealand. I think archaeology is changing, but at a slightly slower pace. Um, I feel like in New Zealand, um, archaeology is about know, maybe 20 years behind the museum space in terms of um, the way that it sees itself um, and the way that it sort of sees its, um, its own colonial past. Um, but, you know, I, I, think, I think changes are making, but you need people in those spaces to push those, to push those agendas. And um, I've sort of tried to make it um, my priority that if I can make change, I'll do it. Um, and so I've been um, really lucky to be involved in a, in a project in New Zealand specifically where <clears throat> we've created a, a policy that's been uh, adopted by our Museums Association, Museums Aotearoa, and it's a repatriation policy, repatriation of ancestral remains in um, associated funerary objects. Um, and so I feel like if our country is sort of saying, yes, we are pro-repatriation, then we need to put our money where our mouth is. And, and that policy needs to sit within our museum sector and they need to own it. Even though I helped write it, <laughs> it belongs in that space. And yeah, so I just, I feel like, you know, they, they need to own that. If, 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 they're, if they're saying those words, then then actions need to, um, need to, to meet that. Um, thinking about what I would change in the way that archaeology or anthropology is practiced here in New Zealand, <clears throat> I think what I would change is the way it's taught rather than the practice, because I think that's where it starts. Absolutely. Um, and yeah, and I find, you know, with my experience, um, you learn all about the theory and the practice of archaeology and um, <clears throat> you, but you don't look at it from the perspective of the communities in which you're studying. So for me, I would like, um, in New Zealand in particular, I think the treaty needs to be um, incorporated into the study of archaeology because it, it, if you're going to work as an archaeologist in New Zealand, you need to understand the relationships with Tanda Te Whenua, with the people of the land. And you need to understand um, your role, your place within that within that space. So, yeah. So I think definitely, you know, whether it's um, working with the Indigenous Studies Department to learn about the history of New Zealand, not necessarily from an archaeological perspective, but from an Indigenous perspective. Um, I think you know, I think that would that would do a lot. And it's not necessarily done here in New Zealand at the moment. There is a gap. The indigenous perspective is not um, not taught within archaeology. Um, also, I think ethics really need to come into it, and and we need to be asking the question: who is it, whose ethics are we considering? Uh, because again, my ethics as an indigenous archaeologist is maybe different from the ethics of a non-indigenous archaeologist, 
and so you know we can't they are definitely situational um yeah and actually also things like repatriation so in new zealand repatriation um for many archaeologists is a given i wouldn't say repatriation but reburial um it's not often that um uh, that groups will agree to have their ancestors taken away and test and have studies done right. on them. It does happen, right. um, but for the most That's part, good. if that happens, then they need to be reburied straight away. And actually, yeah, there's a diversity of perspectives, yeah. kind of. And we need to understand yeah. what yeah. the benefits are of any research that's undertaken. There has to be benefits sure. for the descendants. They can't just yeah. be. Yeah, right, be, right. Yeah. yeah. Dave, do you want to sort of take over, take over on I, that one? Amber, thank you. And, and Jill, I really uh, responded uh, well to some of the, the things you're covering. So I, right, what I'm going to concentrate in my little short time is the way forward. And I think, Amber, you're good. We never give up. One of the things is our communities, our elders. We ha I have the privilege of being here with my Western knowledge and hats and that. But, you know, we've had countless elders before us who've done these things who don't get the mention, but who drive and are there and will always be there, which is part of our role now is to passing on these range of skills and strengths to our, our younger one. Um, but having had the floor now, I, I, one of these, uh, I do everything sort of arse ended as we say, so I'm doing my PhD now and it's about, um, I've been involved in Australia on every code of ethics. Back in 1990, I worked with Hirari in Matunga. We drafted and wrote the WAC World Archaeological Code of Ethics. So in here in Australia, I wrote the Ask First Guidelines Consoling Communities. We've done a lot of these things, but they're just can't gut guides. There's nothing in legislation like thou shall not destroy a site. And if you do, you'll get prosecuted, which doesn't happen here. Um, uh, so <laughs> after 30 years that I thought I failed miserably as a career Indigenous archaeologist, we're just going, oh, on my watch, they're blowing up sites 30 years in. I'm going to pull out here. So what we've decided, we've been doing for some time, and well, firstly, I'll say what my PhD is. It's called uh, Australian, I'm, I'm doing it on community archaeologies. I'm trying to set a guide. We've been using the four term, the OCA charter, a guide to efficiently, effectively, or, you know, de developing equitable partnerships, working with communities, respecting heritage, blah, blah. So I'm, my PhD is going to be on Australian Indigenous community archaeologies from within. Our, as Robin Bancroft, none of us around the world know many who are Indigenous archaeologists unless we're in a, in a PhD position in a university because we're out there doing the stuff. We've been doing it for 30 years, as Robin Bancroft says. Let us show you how it's done. Well, it's not big noting ourselves, firstly, but it's getting the ethics right, respecting our elders, our, what our communities want. Part of being an Indigenous archaeologist has been taking mining companies to court. I've taken 20 or 30 over the years. I mean, who does that in the archaeological discipline? You don't learn that in the books. But when your communities and elders ask you, that's what we, we do. And we're not necessarily good lawyers. So, we need to get out what is appropriate. We've written Ask First Guidelines, a guide for consulting Indigenous people about heritage values. They're all out there. It's just getting people to listen or to have that space in universities to teach. What I've been doing in one of the communities lately, one thing is also, there's no point of just whinging. No one, you've got to bring people with you. And uh, so I've been doing a lot of documentaries and things now. I hated social media networking, but we've got to do it to get our voices out. And that's why I'm tough to be here today. So we're doing, one of the things I'm looking at and we're doing docos, I refuse to take, believe that, you know, these traditional enemies, the farmers of Australia and Aboriginal people, as promoted by the Farmers Federation, the Minerals Council, can't get on. Well, that's crap, folks. Farmers are more in tune with the country, the land and the, and the economic benefits of the looking after country for their kids' future. And those things. So we've been bringing Aboriginal people and farmers together over around a place, and we're doing documentaries on that to promote that. I'm not telling you how to do it, but if you have a mutual respect, learn through a mutual shared values. And we, are, as I thought, say we there's a discord between what government's doing and destroying our heritage environment to what the people feel. So we're doing more of these, which is, you know, you need people to go, hey, you know what, we have been racist. Let's change that, and let's care for our country. That's the way to do it. I can't tell someone to do it. But if you can just put out the facts, my whole career is about a moral fabric basis. So I'm glad to still be here. 
and haven't been shot as we would be in other parts of the world. Um, so documentaries, in information raising, that's what we're doing. I'm doing it at the moment in a lot of our communities. PhDs, one of the things I'm doing at the, my, my thing at the Australian National University, it's not rocket science, but I'm teaching as my, my staffing requirement. I'm not, because I'm doing a PhD, I'm not running whole courses, but I'm offering the School of Arc and the whole of ANU. Um, it's a, a little a little course, it's called in a program, which I and I'm bringing a number of elders in, called Indigenous Cultural Competency, mentor, a, a mentorship program for staff, for those who perhaps should do it and but voluntary if they want, and students. I'm thinking of working as a consultant going out and seeing young kids going, oh, I'm doing this archaeology for the money because I make a fortune. Help. The whole concept of even respecting our nation, our country, our history, our heritage is gone. It's not there. Get the money out of the archaeology as a career. And so my little little two bit to this is we're going to make these kids cultural confidence before they can get out the door. Um, and maybe we could do that for for archaeological staff around every university. These are little things, and you know they get the kudos to unis for this. I'm proposing this at the Australian Archaeology Conference next month for all universities teaching archaeology. Then I can say, well, how about letting some black fellows in the doors as well to teach? I mean, this right. is something we've been doing for ages. The last one, yes, yeah, sorry, it's an, it's a cultural company program. But there's always ways. I use we use a moral argument, in, and we're still using it to challenge these racist notions or this Western ideology that we own this. And well, while we want to be part of that, it's all we have to get. We have to get down to realistically equitable partnerships, and that's about mutual right. respect. Excellent. Thank you, Dave. Um, uh, a, I think I'll do Aaron and Matt again. <laughs> that, that, that order worked well last time. So yeah, so thinking of the way forward, right, in terms of you know what kinds of things are. Did you know my talk? My talk wants to join us. <laughs> um, and then thinking I about. I think you should just let your kids join us. Sorry. Go ahead. I know, right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so um, I would say that you know I we I. Both Sheila, you know, in your introduction, and then me briefly when I introduced myself, talked about how there have been um, a number of conversations about ethical practice in primate field work, and I would I would say that a lot of the the conversations and and then written outcomes that have generated from those conversations have addressed some of these issues of decolonization. They just weren't necessarily labeled as such, but I think. Um, one in particular, which um, it, it was it was already brought up by both Amber and Kaberi here, was thinking about the sociocultural context in which we're working. And I think this is like this is obviously something that's critical for all areas of bioanthropology, and one could argue really for all fields that that are done, um, in, particularly in an international context. And I think you know that was a lot of the essence of some of that. The, the, the ethical conversations because many primatologists, particularly if their background is more in the natural sciences, are going into the field thinking, well, I'm just here to study the primates. I don't care about the people. I didn't choose to study primates. I don't care about people, right? And the argument was that, yes, but you are still working in, an, in another country. You are a foreigner. You are a guest. You're often employing local villagers. You are conducting research that has impact on communities, right? And you need to be mindful of these kinds of things. So kind of broadening those conversations. So those conversations have been going on for quite some time. Um, I think more recently, we're seeing movements in terms of explicitly talking about issues of diversity, equity, inclusion. And we're seeing that absolutely in primatology with, you know, development of uh, standing committees for some of our major scholarly societies. Um, you know, having like special sections in, in journals devoted to issues of equity, inclusion, and diversity. But of course, decolonization is not just about, I mean, those are obviously related terms, but it's not just about, um, about that. Um, so, I mean, one of the things that, that I think, you know, I, I think that needs to happen too, again, in primatology is to, to make these even more explicit, right? So again, because one could, you know, maybe some from the perspective of some people is they're thinking that, you know, kind of ecological systems are kind of devoid of, of 
human histories of colonialism. And of course they're not, but maybe they're not seeing decolonization as something that's important to their, to their practice, their science. And so we have to make that more explicit. So these kinds of conversations are probably more likely to be happening in fields that have a more humanistic dimension, right? But for primatology, which again, globally is, is generally much more often occupied by people from the natural sciences, that for people to talk about it, you have to put it in their face, right? So I'm thinking of, for example, of, you know, here I'm thinking of, you know, for example, Michelle Rodriguez, who's a primatologist here in the United States, put together like a reading list, right, that's available online for, you know, decolonization and primatology, right? So that, and it's a living document that people can continue to add to, but it's a, it's a starting place where people look for this kind of material. Or publishing papers on this topic. A recent paper was published by Sean Waters and her colleagues on decolonizing primate conservation practice, right? That's in the title, right? right. That, that makes it more visible and makes it something that primatologists should care about. And I think that's, that's, that's certainly part of the way forward. And then I think also for, for this, you know, also in addition to thinking about and being paying attention to the sociocultural context in which we're living in is to think really deeply about what true collaboration looks like. Yes. And if we don't have it, and if we don't see it, like, so I, I shared earlier how I've struggled with how sometimes my collaborators, I have, you know, I'm working with people that are outside of my field and they, they have been super helpful in some ways, but again, they don't have necessarily the expertise in primatology or the student bodies to, to participate in the research. So I guess my point here is that if those don't exist, then find ways to make them exist, right? Yeah. right? So to you know, start build research capacity in those areas, particularly if we're talking about students and scholars that have interests, right? Um, and so if we are in a pri privileged position to do that, and I will be very frank, like I'm a full tenured professor, I have a position of privilege where I can devote my research time to capacity building in Indonesia so that students in Sulawesi can learn the skills that they need to be doing the research themselves and not relying on you know, researchers from the global north to spearhead these projects. I realize that not everybody is in that position, but for those of us that are, it's time for us to step up. Thank you. Wow, that was like a mic drop, Aaron. <laughs> and we're done. No, I'm just kidding. Okay, um, uh, Matt. <laughs> yeah, the one of the disadvantages of being last is everyone has said so many good things already that I don't want to just echo. But I agree with everything. And, and yet you make very original contributions. That's why I think you bring <laughs> up the word perfectly. Um, so the specific question that was asked for me is like, uh, what are the you know major solutions to issues in the applied fields um, versus just research and also it, for junior scholars? Um, and I could talk for more than five minutes about both those things, um, but in the applied fields, I think particularly in forensic anthropology, the one of the biggest issues that, um, that I see is, um, for example, in the Philippines, there really is no, no body of forensic anthropology. There's very, very, very few people who would call themselves forensic anthropologists, and there's uh, no anthropologists within uh, gov government bodies that actually do anthropological casework. Um, and so a lot of the times, and this is true for many other countries, a lot of the times you have foreign scientists going into these countries. And the major issue that I feel um, has not necessarily been um, solved or addressed is the prejudices that they bring when going into these countries, um, yeah. the biases that they bring in and the expectations that that how they do things is the way that things should be done um, and a big big part of that um, those prejudices those expectations is the expectation of objectivity in science and um, particularly in forensic sciences as a whole where you as a scientist should be unbiased and only speak to wh what the evidence in front of you tells you. Um, and to me, that is a very colonial way of thinking. Um, for example, we think that 
uh, as forensic anthropologists and forensic scientists, we uh, think that our emotions have nothing to do with it. The, we should separate ourselves from local stakeholders, let's say the families of victims that we're investigating, because that can influence um, the way that we operate. And then you go into these countries, uh, you do your science, you say like, all of my science tells me that these bones are your loved ones. Here you go. Now you can find closure. And then the local stakeholders are like, well, we already knew that. Like, we know that our, per that our person is uh, killed. That doesn't give us closure. Um, just because you tell me with all the science that these bones are them really doesn't mean anything to me. Um, and so as the scientists, you're like, oh, I thought that's what you wanted because that's, you know, that's how we're trained to think. Um, that that uh, somehow that's that's our contribution to the larger good that we're providing closure that we're you know working for human rights etc. Without doing the first basic step of like working with these stakeholders and actually saying like what do you want from this and how can we provide that to you right? It's not the same for every context. Even in the U.S., it's not it's not the same for everyone. Um, this 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 idea of like identification and of um, of bringing closure to family members. Um, so involving them in that that decision making uh, and not just treating them as informants um, would would I feel be very beneficial for the field in terms of you know soul searching and um, trying to dismantle these these Western ideas of of objectivity as the gold standard. Um, yeah, I think um, in terms of junior scholarship, yeah. there, this, this is a hard one because as a junior scholar, I feel that it is not my responsibility to, to change the environment because you're not in a position of power to do so. You're at a disadvantage. And it's always been my philosophy that it's like, it's not my job, but it will eventually become my job. Like as I go up the ladder, right? Um, sorry, she <laughs> am I out of time? No, I mean, what I, no, uh, no, there's one more minute. Okay, um, well, so, so these attitude changes that we're talking about uh, really have to come from the top down in my opinion, and, and as junior scholars, we have to work towards not falling into the same patterns that our predecessors had laid out for us. And, and the important, how we do that, I think, is just being very reflexive about our practices, um, being cognizant and, and actually like putting um, worth in those types of decolonizing uh, diversity and equity practices. I feel like as a scholar, as someone in academia, those types of works are not held to the same regard as, let's say, basic yeah. research. Um, they're, they're deemed as less important, like this published parish mentality where the science should be what props you up and anything you do with inclusion, with diversity, with equity um, is, doesn't matter for your tenure portfolio, portfolio essentially. Yeah. Um, so, yeah. so it is that attitude change that needs to change because you know if you don't, yeah. if we now in the current moment don't uh, strive to make these things important uh, in the eyes of people who bestow power upon us, uh, the field is going to die out. It's going to fizzle and shrivel up and go extinct. Um, without yeah. but placing importance in these practices. I, I feel like the, the, the title of uh, my next grant is going to be, what do you want from this and how can we provide that to you? <laughs> so that really needs to be what we center. I mean, I, you know, I started this out sort of highlighting how all of you, what you do ultimately, um, what I think makes it a superpower is 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 that you really center 
uh, compassion and humility and voice, right? You do that in your actions, in your work. You, I love what all of you do because you are enacting um, ideas and not just talking about them. And um, I feel like that's the underlying theme is for, you know, indigenous populations. What do you want from this and how can we provide that to you? So um, Matt, despite what you think about thinking everyone else has already said everything, that's not the case. It's really helpful. Um, so, so we have um, we have so many wonderful questions, and um, I think uh, the one that I'd like to start with, and and really anyone can sort of jump in. And Kaberi, if you um, if you want to jump in, just start talking, and we will all, you know, uh, make sure that make that we make space for you. But um, so there's a question about how there's a lot of um, you know, uh, so a, a couple of you really brought up um, the role that foreign researchers play, and in particular, needing to follow the rules of the countries in which they're researching. And um, and Kaberi, you you mentioned this as well, but you know, there are oftentimes regulations that treat um, indigenous people and natural resources um, uh, very paternalistically. And so, so the um, you know the panel. What do you? What are your thoughts on um, doing what's respectful, even sort of in spite of government regulations, as opposed to you know, in order to respect and follow government regulations? Hmm. That's an interesting question. I yeah. uh, personally, you know, from my own experiences um, and also seeing other uh, field biologists or field researchers experiences i think you know um for foreign researchers as well as you know indian research i mean south asian researchers i think you need to you ought to learn the um the style uh, of how to talk to bureaucrats um in a lot of times i think we uh, we researchers are you know waiting to be, go and do field work without you know wasting our time and that is actually not a great idea because you know i uh, because that doesn't give you if you don't connect with the policy makers you don't collect connect with the bureaucrats if you don't connect with the uh, local community then you don't really get the support especially if you are if you want to do any long term work mm -hmm. um the, and for doing this i think the two basic things that need to be changed in the uh, in the us i don't know about europe but in the us at least uh, us educational system or uh, graduate uh, school system is that you have to give the researchers more time um you don't you can't chase them saying that you need to finish it in two or three years something like that um, the other thing is that you need to incorporate the U.S. universities need to incorporate, um, you know, some of these courses about, uh, you know, the especially I think it will be in public science how to talk, how to communicate with um, people, not just the local indigenous communities or bureaucrats, but I, actually we don't really know as a as a scientist we do not get trained in how to speak to other people. Uh, forget mm -hmm. about other countries, right? And so that communication skill has to be as part of the curriculum because otherwise we are not going to learn anything. That's true. Not everybody can speak. I mean, I, I can talk in our must, you know, anytime, but that's not that's not everybody can do it. So I think this this kind of uh, educational institution changes have to be done in has to be done in order to accommodate you know um, the indigenous community or local community involvement um, the other thing is also i think that for funding a lot of the funding agencies do not put the money that required for you to stay um, extra time um, in order to understand the local culture right or local history so i think the funding agencies are also need to think about how they are going to fund uh, fund research yeah. researches so so i think yeah. those are the few things that i'm thinking right now and also yeah. proper evaluation yes. one more thing i think the yeah. i think what happens is that we have these all these diversity inclusion trainings and everything you know equity trainings or we talk about it i myself was in a board um, where i was the token you know diversity member so uh, but 
when it comes to listen to them or when it comes to implement those things we don't do it you know and i have seen it in academic institutions i mean i've, I've been you know a survivor i can say of this kind of um, attitude of uh, you know um, in academic institutions in um, non profit organizations uh, in the us uh, as a person of color so i think those those think ought to change you know you need to do some evaluations yeah. of whether that you actually done good um, you know communications with locals or established any any kind of relationships with the with the local communities or marginalized communities or whatever way you can say yeah. i think that's where and, i should start and, no, and and some <laughs> of you spoke about in, in inherent tensions between you know within the countries you know between a government and um indigenous rights or citizen rights so so does does anyone want to sort of speak about that tension when trying when outside researchers are trying to do the right you know right thing whatever that is whatever that is um, yeah. Dave, I think you, yeah, I think uh, I mean, we're I'll, 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 I'll start with, There's certainly a public perception where it is in relation to human rights. But what we have to, and I acknowledge, uh, certainly here in Australia, our entire media is Murdoch uh, 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 driven uh, with its agenda. It's also sponsoring our government and our government agenda in pro-mining, pro this, anti-climate um, change. The negative discourse on anything indigenous, um, apart from a, a black fellow wearing a hard hat and high vis at a mine site is, is negative. Um, uh, it's perceived as negative. So that's what, they're some of the challenges we have. So it's a, we need to have a, a Black Lives Matter or just the truth telling to, to, to put the spotlight, Australia is, has been wonderful and it attempts still over the world at UN meetings on climate change and everything to disguise really what it's doing. And it's so obvious. And, um, and that's why I say there is a discord, I feel, within our public and our own education of the world ourselves and our prejudices of what we've done to what the government's saying. But when we're sponsored by multi-corporates, when we're sponsored by media moguls who have an agenda, we, we look like we've become out more foolish. And, and that's the change I think that's happening here today. One thing we say, and with a bit of attempt of humility, but just the reality is people who care for self, family and our country and our future, because we are part of that, have some of the answers for caring, sharing for our, well, in some of the issues that we're dealing today. And even if it's just a reflection of truth telling of our history here, acknowledging it, opening the doors, getting the, you know, the cobwebs out of what we've done and where we're at. I think, you know, that can go on. We're all proud and just Australian and we're, and we have a desire to help to where we're going in the future, climate change. But let's get some of these basic things that are chaining us back and not moving forward as a nation, as a people. And now time more than ever in terms of what the issues that we're addressing uh, globally in the socioeconomics, but also within the whole climate change thing. And I think indigenous peoples, if asked, firstly are, you know, can take an apology as such, but we also have some of the answers, but we also have the drive, we have survived so long as to what we need to do. But we're also good at building communities as part of that, because everyone in indigenous Australia has a place. Thank you. Um, Matt, I don't know if you, uh, well, I'll, I'll, I'll go to another question, although honestly, that was that one I, I could ask, I want to ask all of you. <laughs> Does anyone else have anything they want to contribute to, to that one, to that whole question of the, of the, sometimes the problematic power dynamics within the region that you're working in that, I mean, those of you who are from the countries, you know, obviously have a different perspective, but for, for an outsider coming, um, if you want to throw that in later, please feel free to. Um, we have another question about um, the trend towards um, researchers 
and and Aaron brought this up from the north, getting the funding, leading the projects, and then kind of you know it, um, having this very imbalanced uh, version of what collaboration looks like. Mm -hmm. And um, so, can can you all speak to um, specific ways that the collaborations can be improved. And this kind of brings in a couple of other questions that people have asked, including like, you know, just some of the junior scholars are saying, okay, I'm just starting out. I don't want to get it wrong. And so, I mean, if you can sort of, you know, I mean, you know, you talked about cultural competency, competency data. So what is there sort of a general form of cultural competency for not reproducing these problems and these higher hierarchical structures, especially for American students who um, are coming from just in, these very inherently privileged positions globally. Well, if I could jump in just for a second, one of the things is just having the discussion, having an Indigenous uh, involvement in these discussions, elders, not just Indigenous academics, but our why, a reflection of our communities. But it's about respect, and I, you know, it's also about self-respect. Uh, some of these key things. So, say when we talk about cultural comedies, we use that today because. Sometimes we, we in our academic institutions, and even ourselves in indigenous academics, some have to, you know, we're on pedestals, and sometimes, you know, the the disconnect between our community yeah. concerns and uh, something. So in our universities, we have to have our indigenous network forums to keep us on track. Too. But on a wider issue, I mean, it, it's about respect. It's about some of the guidelines we've produced. Ask first, a guide to consulting Ask indigenous first. I mean. <laughs> What's so frustrating for me today, we wrote this, we've done all this 30 years or more right. ago, and here we yeah. are, folks, blowing up site. Ooh, sorry about that. Um, we're, and the only reason they got caught was because the world on Black Lives Matter put the spotlight here. So, you can hear ask my frustration. First. That's a, so, that's a, no, I mean, ask first. That's, that's a really good yeah. one. Does anyone else kind of want to, I'm like, I'm putting that down. Number one, ask first. <laughs> Oh, uh, you know, what are some other important practices? Yeah, that, that um, you think, Erin, what are some things that you, oh, Amber or Amber, yeah. Oh, sorry. Go. Well, I was just going to um, say, sorry, Erin, <laughs> um, that every year I speak to incoming Fulbright scholars that come to New Zealand. Yeah. And, um, and so, you know, they often talk to me about their research projects that they want to do and they want to work with the communities and, um, and the first thing I ask them is, how how does your research benefit them? And yes. they're like, oh, oh, oh right. you know, how does your great, research benefit them? Yeah, there's going to be some great things that will come out, and, and it'll be great. I say, yeah, but if you want to go and and, and um, interact or work with the community, you have to yeah. be able to acknowledge and identify how it benefits them, because you're going into yeah. that community, you're taking all of their knowledge. Um, doing your research, and then you're never seen again, um, for the most part. And you know, and so that's yeah. one of the things that I really try and push yeah. um, when asked about that kind of that kind of thing. And you're right, Dave. You know, ask first. You you know, it's it's not yeah. good to come into a situation, particularly in New Zealand, as probably the same in Australia, with an already preconceived idea of what you want to do and what you want that collaboration to look like, because you're pretty much right. saying to a community i've got this great idea yeah. let's work on it collaborative collaboratively but i've already written everything up and you just need to sign it you know that's, that's right, right. and uh, yeah and kaberi was saying that earlier right like that there's this mm. sort of at least in for american institutions like or maybe it was Aaron, but like you have to go in knowing what you're asking and that doesn't teach them you have to go in yeah. um i mean listening Erin, are there things that you teach your students to do yeah kind of building on what's already been said too just like one of the key things is like going into the research and, and maybe slowing down a little bit right because we often are like okay i'm here i gotta get on i gotta start like i gotta start collecting data right it's all about collecting data and it's like slowing down a little bit and building trust in the communities in which we're working mm -hmm. in and that has been more applicable to the kind of work my students and I are, have been doing because I because of the nature of my work, right? We 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 are interfacing with the communities and how they are dealing with you know 
conflict with with wild animals, right? So that is something that that there that we're but but even if it's not, right? It's kind of like you still need to to you know make sure the community understands what your research is all about, right? Like so that it's not right. misunderstood. Right. So I think that's been something that that is an important dimension, right? Is 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 recognizing ourselves as primatologists um as as social actors right not just not just scientists but that you know that we have to be a part of this community as well and making sure that the objectives are understood but then also the research is communicated back right so like mm. that's critical too in forums that that are not going to necessarily be accessible so we can talk about you know disseminating to the scholarly committee and we can talk about the language issues that we talked about earlier right those are that's certainly yeah. an issue but then there's also forums like very you know, like informally or even formally, right. but at the village level, for example, right? So that the community understands, okay, what did you do actually? Because, you know, yeah. otherwise we're just doing parachute science. We're coming in, doing our work, and then, you know, out we go. So yeah. could, Dave looks, well, yeah, yeah, Dave, well, go ahead, yeah. One of the things about asking first, and this is a two-way dialogue, it's not just you, you, you question yourself, but then asking the community, and in all honesty, as they're all building your relationship there. Is, is this research or is my project or the nature of my questions or how it has published or filmed late or going to cause any harm to that community? Uh -huh. that? So, but part of that is building that relationship. So Erin's point, yes, to come back, slow down a bit. Um, and it's having that discussion, and that's why I talk about cultural comments about realizing that the cultural context of which you're going in to with the peopling of that area on whatever topic you may choose may have a different cultural outlook or uh, a need or, or something may cause harm so it's being aware of that and that's kind right. of again developing equitable partnerships but you need to have right, that right. dialogue and respect to be able to listen and to to be informed yeah, yeah. That, you know, that's really wonderful, you know, because so many um, for the National Science Foundation grant in the US, uh, one of the critical pieces is broader impacts. And, you know, the intention of that is very good, which is um, it can't just be, you know, like there's a parachute science. It can't just be for yourself. At the same time, there does end up being this very paternalistic or colonial um, framing of broader impacts, which is I'm going to get all the knowledge about the macaques or, you know, I'm going to get all the knowledge about, you know, the Willandra Lakes remains. And then I'm going to go back and I'm going to teach those people all about what I learned. Right. And and I think that reframing what constitutes broader impacts also should change so that it's not just this. I extracted knowledge and now I'm going to go tell you back. But I think broader impacts is also I sat and listened to you for a month <laughs> and I listened to your stories about prehistory, your stories about the significance of this area or this species or whatever, I absorbed that into my research design and that is the broader impact, right? I mean, so anyway, that's my own thought, but this is for you all to talk. Um, there's one more question. We have time for one more question before I, I uh, have to let you all go on your day and it's two in the morning for me, so I'm gonna go to bed. But um, the last question that I would um, love to get um, your, feedback on is um, is really sort of an epistemology question. And it's about how um, in, in your work, wherever it is that it is, how do the indigenous populations feel about the scientific analysis that's being conducted, whatever it is, right? And so, you know, so the questioner is talking about DNA, but really it could be anything. Um, about how scientific knowledge um, as defined in a, in a Western Christian sense is um, constructed. Um, what, are, what are your experiences with this? And so that can be anything from um, like, you know, DNA analysis or skeletal remains um, or, you know, whatever sort of data that you're all working with that are used, at least in the Western sense, to, to produce scientific knowledge. That wasn't a very clear question, was it? Do I, should I find the question there? <laughs> I'm oh. Follow that thread for a minute. So, how, what is your experience in um, integrating different uh, forms of scientific analyses in uh, in collaborations with indigenous communities? Well, here in Australia, we haven't been asked and, yet. 
Well, that's a problem. Um, and, and and Matt, whenever you get a chance, you know, um, I mean, either in Hawaii or in the Philippines, um, you know, you brought up a really wonderful point about like, you know, what is objectivity and I'm going to handle these bones. And I know, Amber, you've also talked about, you know, the very ways that different um, communities, even in one region, let alone across across Southern Eurasia um, and Australasia, it, consider what it means. Some skeletal, some communities don't find skeletal remains to be problematic as objects of scientific analyses. Others do. Um, you know, does DNA form identity construction? Does it have nothing to do with identity construction? Um, have you engaged with any of these kinds of questions when you're collaborating with the indigenous communities and, and their interests in the kind of data we I work think with? Yeah, I think I think so. I think it's important that um, not everything is treated as a monolith, and that you, as a as, as a parachuter, um, be cognizant that that of how you, like you said, epistemology, the how you think, and why you think the way you think, and going into a situation assuming that that is not the correct or default um, ways of thinking that you should bring into the situation. Um, so right, it, it always starts first with uh, communication. Um, and like I said earlier, like what do you need and how can we we work together to bring that need to fruition? Um, and in forensics, that, that, that really means like, um, this this awful thing happened, right? This, this this tragic event happened, whether it's a natural disaster, whether it's a transportation accident, whether it's a homicide or suicide, this awful thing happened. Um, and in some ways, like the state is obligated to answer a certain set of questions, like who is this person? Um, and you really have to think about like why they need to ask that. It's because of death statistics, not because they cared. Um, it's because like they lost a taxpayer, right? Um, and they need to like record that. Um, but then when you're dealing with the family, not every family is is a monolith, and you have to if you if your goal going into that situation is really to provide a service um, to them, like a scientific service, uh, you have to understand like how that service uh, can be turned meaningful in their specific situation of despair, right? It's not just because like you, I, I'm gonna, you know, cut a piece of bone and run DNA. Can you please donate your um, family reference sample to me? Um, and I will confirm that this is your loved one. Like that may be something they want, right? But that also may be something that, that just adds to their grief. Um, Right. That reopens right. wounds. So if you right. not if you're not starting off from from clarifying what you can provide, then you're just setting yourself up for failure. Yes. Doesn't I mean? So Dave, I was gonna cut, like move, move to you and say, okay, it's no small deal that you said we haven't been asked, and like I feel like Matt just kind of cut to it, right? Like, well. Certainly, yeah. the different discussions, say in archaeology, for a long time, it was peak, there was a group calling in the name of science. This is our right. Well, then, no, it's actually not. You're dominating our space, keeping us locked out, and um, refusing to deal with our issues. But there's the issues. I'm sorry. Back to the community on the general issue of: Have we ever had a, a national meeting of indigenous peoples and elders to talk about? what our concerns are with the disciplines or some of the, we've never had that. We've dealt with a case to case when we've got people on the door wanting to research tape. The Wallandris situation, let me tell you, as the former chairman of the land elders, the elders wanted those remains buried 60 years ago. But when you own the governance of how the media is put out, there's a government line. The elders are now demanding all the remains to be reburied. When I was chair, I had to deal with the executive office of the Willandra when the Mungo Man collections for Alan Thorns were being brought back. The archaeologists were stealing the remains, getting them CAT scanned at the Canberra Hospital. I had to deal with that. Right. And then 
deal with the persecution of the governance of that taking on one of theirs. So it's the angle of where at the position where we're starting this this uh, the ethics clearance, if you like. We have great ethics or well, getting improved ethics clearances in place today. Um, but there's bigger pictures I think we could have of saying, well, are the academies of science within Australia adequately representing or reflecting Indigenous concerns across the spectrum of yeah. areas of studies or have our own epistemologies of, of any of our uh, world yeah. been taken yeah. adequately? There's so many areas. So, you know, there's certainly scope for the future and we're getting touching on it slowly. Yeah. Um, I I could go for another hour and uh, but but it's time for us to wrap up unfortunately and I agree that we this is really just the beginning of touching on um, some very important points everything I say is going to sound like a platitude but but really this was amazing it was incredible and I have pages of notes and I learned so much and I have probably another three hours of questions for all of you um, I want to thank each and every one of you for your wisdom and your dedication to the topic and um, and for sharing your knowledge and your time with us. And I want to thank the audience for um, staying with us, especially those of you who are in um, mine and Becky and Lauren's time zone. And uh, the Committee on Diversity, the American Association of Physical and Biological Anthropologists, and um, Birkin Associates and the University of Toronto. And we have um, lots of other questions and the this needs to be just the beginning and not, you know, the end. And so I won't be dropping this. I will be bugging all of you again and um, and continuing, continuing the discussion and, and sharing answers in, in other fora. So thank you everyone for coming and I hope you have a good Wednesday or Thursday. <laughs> thank you, Sheila. Thanks, Thanks everyone. everyone. Thank you, Bye, everyone. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, audience. Thank you. That was magnificent. Thanks.